You can just nod if you're thumbs up. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the League of Women Voters Austin Areas Program, Starting School, Voices of Hope, Concern, and Advocacy. My name is Jessica Foreman, and I am the Director of Advocacy for the Austin Area League, and I'm gonna be your moderator tonight. Uh, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Before we get started tonight, I want to give you a few updates about Zoom and the kind of etiquette we're going to need you to use tonight. And first, I want to let you know that we are recording this program and we are going to be placing it on our social media in a few days, so please keep that in mind. We do encourage you to ask questions. Uh, we may be able to get through a few questions during the midst of the program, and then we'll have some time for some additional ones at the end of the program. The way we're going to have you ask questions tonight is through the chat feature. And this chat feature is going to go to one of our moderators, which means that it won't be public who asked the question. And then she will pop in and ask the question to our speakers tonight. Uh, we'll also ask that everybody stay on mute throughout the presentation unless you're speaking to prevent background noise. And we're also going to have you turn off um, your video unless you're a panelist um, and use speaker view for Zoom. That will help you kind of keep distractions to a minimum throughout this whole thing. We hope that during this program, you will learn more about how we are preparing for the start of school this year. Our speakers all have a strong concern that we pay attention to the safety and well-being of everyone involved in the start of school. That means parents, students, teachers, school employees, and school administrators. We also know that what happens in one place, the school environment in this case, will affect the whole general community surrounding the school. And we're especially concerned that the overall well-being of students is taken into account. Their overall development, including their social, emotional, intellectual, and physical, and their sense of belonging to a community that really cares about them. So with that being said, we're grateful to have an excellent group of speakers here tonight. Our first speaker that I'm going to introduce is Dr. Joseph. Dr. Joseph joined the University of Texas at Austin in 2015 as founding director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Prior to joining UT, Dr. Joseph was a professor at Tufts University in Massachusetts, where he also founded the School Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. Dr. Joseph's career focus has been on what he describes as Black Power Studies, which encompasses interdisciplinary fields such as Africana Studies, Law and Society, Women's and Ethnic Studies, and Political Science. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. Uh, what do you have to share with us tonight about the opening of schools? Hey, thank you, Jessica. And I'll, I'll uh, keep this um, uh, brief. I think that, um, the number one thing that we're all facing, especially in the context of this past week and the violence that we've seen in Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, is how do we come together uh, as a group of people, as a community, uh, as friends and neighbors and try to build uh, what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. called uh, a beloved community. Um, this is a really harrowing time and a tragic time in American history. Um, but it's also a very uh, deeply inspiring time as well. So for those of us who are parents, I'm sure many of us have cried about seeing um, Jacob Blake, but also hearing about uh, the two protesters who were killed um, on Tuesday night and to see all this kind of violence and how do we explain this to our kids and our children. And so I think as we prepare for the opening of school, uh, and tomorrow is the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Uh, it's also going to be, there's going to be a March on Washington 2020. Uh, thousands of people are going to be in the nation's, of ca nation's capital tomorrow. Um, is really try to prepare our children and to talk to them about um, what does it mean to be uh, a citizen? Uh, what does it mean to be um, a person who's deeply empathetic and leads with vulnerability? Uh, to, to their fellow citizens and their friends and their neighbors? Um, how can we all uh, do our best to enlarge in our moral circle? Uh, because one of the things that Dr. King 
uh, said at the March on Washington uh, was that now was the time to make real the promise of democracy. And what does that mean? How do we as educators, as parents, as active citizens, um, teach our children uh, the value of a democracy that's anti-racist, that is nonviolent, um, that is free of uh, economic injustice, that's free of hatred against people who are LGBTQIA, uh, against people who are mentally um, disabled or non able bodied. And I think that's what we're all um, facing. And in the context of COVID 19 and the fact that this pandemic has hit all of us, but it's hit all of us differently, uh, how do we explain that to our children? And then in our own lives, how do we try to model uh, the behavior that we want to see out in the public and out in the world, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis those who are um, marginalized, those who live in segregated communities, those who don't have the technology, the Zoom technology that we have and access to it um, to even create uh, different ways that we can come together as, as a community. So I think we have to keep all of that in mind um, and really Again, this is a time where we need to lead with deep empathy and vulnerability, even as there's been a lot of um, fear mongering and a rhetoric of fear uh, and a lot of violence um, in the air. We have to lead and, and, and really exemplify something different. And I think that there's this huge um, generational opportunity here, but we have to also be uh, sober and tell the truth to our children about the challenges and the conflicts we face. I have one who's in kindergarten, but I have others who are um, uh, in the sixth and, and 10th grade respectively. And the, the, we have to talk to them about what's happening in the country, what's happening in the city of Austin, and really relate to them our, our highest ideals of who we are uh, as, a, as a community. Um, and that includes people who are non-citizens, people who are undocumented, um, we have to um, really model what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. tried to model uh, in terms of what he called the fierce urgency of now, this idea of uh, a moral and political uh, transformation, this idea of redeeming the soul of America. Um, and, and Austin is part of that. Austin is part of that larger uh, tapestry. So as we think about um, whether people are going to send their kids to school or just be connected to a virtual community, um, we can no longer live in these isolated bubbles where we say everything is fine in our community and our kids have high test scores and we, we're, we're doing really well and not think that um, the inequality and the racism and the disadvantage will never affect us. And this is another lesson that Dr. King taught us uh, at the March on Washington. And just as a reminder, the March on Washington, the original march was August 28th, 1963, which was a Wednesday, 250,000 people came to the nation's capital between the Washington Memorial uh, and, and the Lincoln, the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial. And um, uh, Congressman John Lewis uh, spoke there too, the youngest speaker of the March on Washington. And he talked about remaking the nation uh, in the image of God and democracy at that march. And of course, Dr. King gave the I Have a Dream speech. So there's a reason why 57 years later, these demonstrations and these protests continue and in 2020 they've reached a high point and a crescendo and for those of us who are interested in education those of us who are interested in um, civil and human rights who are interested in social justice for for women and for men for black latinx for muslims for jews uh, for the whole cradle of humanity um, this is our moment and we've got to take the responsibility and view it as such, as a responsibility, not as a burden. Um, we have to remain hopeful, uh, but we also have to remain dedicated and, and uh, willing to speak truth to power about what's happening in our city, what's happening in our nation. Um, and now is the time to, to, to really vocalize what we actually stand for. Um, the country is uh, at a crossroads, of course. Um, it's been at a crossroads in earlier historical times. Uh, we think about 1968 as well in the aftermath of Dr. King's assassination, Bobby Kennedy's assassination. And in that moment, we pick punishment and uh, criminal justice and mass incarceration instead of picking the beloved community. We're at another 
such moment and we have to um, come together uh, to make different choices that impact all of us uh, in positive ways. And that starts with our children and those of us who love our children, who are interested in nothing but the best for our children, we have to expand that moral circle to be wider than just our children and our family and our friends. What Dr. King challenged us to do was to move away from what he called enemy politics with people who disagree with us, people who, who, who have a different opinion than us. He said there were no enemies um, and that we were all uh, together, living together in what he called the world house, right? He called the entire planet the world house. And he said that we were all inextric inextricably linked uh, in a single garment of mutual destiny. And I think that we're seeing that all around us right now, whether you're in Kenosha, Washington, whether you're an NBA player who's refused to work and people um, are not playing basketball games because they feel that um, there's something more important. And that, that thing that's more important is all of us, is humanity, right? Um, so these are hugely important lessons that uh, are, are being taught right now. And every, the, the protests and the demonstrations that we're seeing are calling all of us to a kind of aspirational citizenship. I remember when Barack Obama was president, he said the, the, the best title that people had in a democracy um, was the, the title of citizen. And that really is something I truly believe. And so those of us who believe in citizenship, um, one that crosses borders and transcends boundaries, uh, we have to be willing to speak truth to power. Uh, those of us who are in faith communities, who are in churches and synagogues and Muslims, um, uh, mosques, we have to be willing to speak truth to power. Those of us who are in secular communities and who think of ourselves as, as humanists, um, we have to be willing to speak truth to power. Those folks who are in law enforcement and the military and other um, first responders uh, have to be willing to speak truth to power and be on the side of justice, be on the side of justice in a way uh, that goes beyond partisanship, that goes beyond ideology, and remember why they got into um, the service-oriented profession they, they chose, the vocation they chose, is because they wanted to help people. Um, and you, you should want to help people irrespective of their background, irrespective of their race, irrespective of their gender, irrespective of their sexuality, irrespective of any kind of difference. So what we're called upon this year, this is an incredibly um, difficult year. This has been a crucible uh, for all of us. Um, but it's also an incredibly hopeful year. We're called upon to um, widen our moral circle um, to be as big as the entire planet, be as big as the entire city of Austin, as big as the United States and as big as the world. Because if we do that, when we see people suffering, we're not gonna think that that's happening to them. We're gonna really be firmly committed and understand that it's happening to us. It's happening to all of us. So the, the reason why at times we can be in our own silos and not connect with tragedies that are happening across the street in our, in our same city, in another neighborhood, is because we think it's happening to other people, but what we're seeing with all the demonstrations and the turmoil and the COVID-19 pandemic is that when it happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. So one of the lessons of the March on Washington, one of the lessons of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was this idea that none of us are free until all of us are free. One of Dr. King's uh, best sayings were that was that injustice anywhere was a threat to justice everywhere, right? And so un unless we come together um, as a community and say that we are gonna center uh, anti-racism and racial justice, we're gonna center uh, people who are poor in this community, we're gonna center people who are non-able-bodied, people who are trans and queer and, and, and gay. Uh, we're gonna center uh, Latinx and people who are undocumented. We're gonna center all these people who we marginalize, um, including children, unless we can all come together and say that, um, we're gonna be missing um, out on building that beloved community. And what's so interesting is that if we succeed in building that beloved community, it reverberates around the world, it reverberates around all of our communities, and we actually live better lives. So the privileges that we lose in creating that beloved community actually 
allows us to uh, become better, uh, to, to, to become more empathetic, uh, to lead with vulnerability and to lead with love. Uh, Cornell West says that justice is what love looks like in public, and I believe that. And so when we think about what we should be telling our children, we should be telling them the truth about this narrative of American history. We should tell them about our flaws, our shortcomings, our mistakes, but we should also tell them about what we are aspiring to be. Um, who do we want to be? And we can, we can, right now, we have a chance to begin again as, as a nation. We have a chance to begin again um, as a city. Um, and we should be taking that opportunity uh, to center justice, to center uh, anti-racism, to center the least of these among us, and to make sure that we're um, living up to um, the creed uh, that we tell our children. You know, we, if we can face ourselves and say, we're telling our children to be kind, to be empathetic, to love uh, one another, and to love their schoolmates, right? Because we love our children. Um, the least we can do is try to every single day live up to that aspirationally, even though we're going to have our shortcomings. And I'll close by saying this, um, Jessica, this is a hugely emotional time for all of us. You know, um, uh, this is a time for a lot of uh, tears, a lot of crying. If, you, if you're a parent, if you care about people, um, you, you know how you feel about what happened to Jacob Blake or Breonna Taylor, or, or, or any of these victims of police violence, including Mike uh, Ramos uh, right here uh, in Austin. Um, we can't forget the dead. We have to um, be candid about the fact that we have people right here in Austin who've, who've, who've died um, unjustly. We can't forget that they've had, they have children, uh, they have families, they have people uh, who love them. Um, and and we, we should never forget, and we should be trying to work to build this beloved community uh, in their memory, in the memory of all these people who we've lost um, and who we shouldn't have lost. If we were a better society, if we were a better country, if we were a better city. So the, the, the onus is on all of us. The onus is on all of us. And again, it's a responsibility and not a burden. And what we should be sharing for our children um, our children's sake, uh, as we open up the school year, is what's happening all around us. We should be sharing that story and we should be telling them that we can be better. Uh, we want them to be better, we can be better, but to be better ourselves, we have to all expand uh, our moral circle and understand what's happening in East Austin, in West Austin, in North Austin, in South Austin, all of it is connected to us. So as long as we have any children who are hungry, as long as we have any children and families who are left behind, who are marginalized, who are homeless, uh, who can't get the help and the aid that they need in this city, this rich, rich city. Dr. King talked about this rich, rich nation. Um, we are all gonna be impoverished. So the lesson for us uh, right here in 2020, and again, tomorrow is the 57th anniversary of the March on Washington, is that we have to make sure that those folks who have uh, died and who have uh, been, been lost uh, have not died in vain. You know, and we have to share this story with our children, our grandchildren. Uh, we have to share this story with the city. Uh, and we really have to um, do everything in our power uh, to build that beloved community right here in Austin. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. You shared some resources with us that we're going to put in the chat and we're going to share on our uh, social media accounts that kind of give folks some steps on how to advocate. Can you just give us a broad view of what those resources are? Yeah, there's um, the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy at the LBJ School at UT. Um, we have a bunch of anti-racist resources. Um, including ways that people can get involved to support uh, local anti-racist organizations. We just did a great webinar with Austin Justice Coalition um, and Kelly Coleman from the city uh, of Austin's equity office and Chris Harris of Texas Appleseed. Um, there's also different books and curriculum and pedagogy, uh, all links that are free that are, that are available for folks. Um, we've had different projects that are supporting uh, just people's um, right to vote 
uh, and, and, and citizenship and, and civic, uh, anti-racist civics as well. Um, so there's, there's, gonna, there's a lot there uh, to, to help people who are wondering how they can, how they can help um, uh, uh, promote social justice and, and equity and racial justice right here in Austin. Thank you. Uh, I was able to look over the resources ahead of time. They're very useful. And I think after your call to action, there'll be a very good follow up for folks that are interested in more specifics. Um, thank you, Dr. Joseph. I know you have to step off early. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. And I think you really hit on one of the big themes for the night, um, the single garment of mutual destiny. Did I get that correct? Yeah, um, yes, yes. <laughs> in a, a single very garment beautiful, of mutual destiny, yes. Beautiful yes. sentiment. Yes. Um, what happens to and one of And that's Dr. Martin happens... Luther King Jr. That is absolutely not me. That's <laughs> no, Dr. Yes. King's um, <laughs> of, To widen our moral circle, what happens to one of us happens to all of us. Um, I definitely think those are why we wanted to hold a program to this. You know, opening schools is a specific policy thing that we have to decide whether or not to do, but it's actually part of this huge, larger conversation as you kind of initiated for us tonight. So again, thank you very much. Thank I you. appreciate your time. Thank you, Jessica. Um, we wanted to hear from a variety of voices tonight. Um, those whose career and passion like Dr. Joseph is surrounding equity, uh, but also we wanted to hear from folks and people that are experiencing this from another perspective and even closer perspective. Um, and that's why we are thankful tonight to be joined by Ms. Nu Chan Finn, an AISD parent, dual language advocate and PTA member. Ms. Chan Finn, welcome. Uh, what do you have to share with the group tonight? Thank you, Jessica. Um, and I would like to thank Dr. Joseph uh, for the speech that he gave just now. And as an Asian woman and a mother, and half of my life live in a different country, and second half of my life here, um, every day I been trying to learn and still learning every day, you know, through navigate through equity lens and also uh, cultural competency. So um, thank you very much for, for the information and what he said. I really appreciate that. Also, um, so I want to share as of experience of a mother in AISD for the past 12 years and I'm still um, in, have two more students in AISD. So like for ex I like to remind everybody that um, the school uh, reopening for or the opening for the new school year 2020 to 21 uh, has postponed for three weeks. So it will start on September 8th and the year will end on June 3rd for all the school in AISD. And uh, for the first eight, uh, four weeks, it will be from September 8th to October 2nd that will be. Um, the online learning only. And um, so today, this evening, just before this meeting, um, one of the principal of my children school um, had arranged a Zoom, which I'm thankful for that, that I have access to, to be able to join the meeting. So the meeting for, for uh, to meet with community and parents and to tell us what to expect this school year as of now. And I'm very thankful for that meeting. And um, so of course, the first four weeks is will be remote learning. And one thing that I think is critical that I learned this evening from the meeting is the first five day of the attendance for the school um, is gonna set the funding for the whole school year for the, for the school for this year and that's from TEA. So we want to make sure that all these first five days of online learning, our students submit one work per day, at least one work per day on BRAIN, which is the program that AISD use, and that would count as attendance and that will help with the funding for the school. So that's very important and I didn't know that before. I, I mean, I heard about attendance, but the detail is here. And also, um, 
the grade will be on all the core contents and also PE music arts. That means your student will still get PE music art through the online learning. So I'm very happy to learn about that. So that's a good thing because especially for the young kids in elementary school, they need that kind of activities to help them feel connect even through the computer. So um, yes, of course, um, talking about computer and iPad. So recently, AISD has uh, bought 24,000 iPads for pre-K-3 up to seven, uh, second grade students so that they will receive iPads. So you just need to go on um, online to register to to register to, leave, uh, to receive the iPad and now it's that the distribution already start and um, also 10,000 Wi-Fi hotspot are distributed, are being distributed to family that need um, internet access. So I'm very thankful for that. And um, of course, once I mentioned that, okay, go online, do this, do this. Um, recently this week, AISD uh, launch uh, Austin ISD app, which is on both Androids and iPhones that you can find it and then um, use it. And the link that I mentioned to go get technology is one of the tile on, on that app. It's called uh, technology distribution. So that something that some parent knows about it, some parents still don't know. And um, the email has been sent out robocall has been sent out so um, keep an eye out check your voicemail if you missed the call and um, do that and then um, it's very easy very convenient to go do the drive to to receive the chromebook or uh, hotspot or ipad for your student and i one more thing that i like to ask the community and parents to uh, pay attention to is um, in November this year, the four out of nine seat of um, AISD Board of Trustee are uh, up for the elections and none of the current boards on these four seats are rerunning again. So all the new, we are going to vote for um, new trust, four new trustee to come in. And that I, I like to um, remind parents and encourage par parents and community that keep an eye out for the candidate forums, uh, contact them. If you have that opportunity, email, phone call, they put it out there that you can find on the website on their application to the trustee. So um, contact them, talk to them, address your concern ask them what they feel, what do what they think about it, how how they feel about it, or what are their visions regarding the issue, the concern that you have, so you know who you want to make decision for your student in the very near future here. And um, one more thing is um, as a PTA member myself, um, I would like to ask and encourage our families, parents, and community members to join PTA because PTA is um, where we can represent the voice for our children, our student, and many um, PTA on AISD now is also on join PTA on the PTA.org and um, you can look up for that and once you join online because right now we can't join in school and then the new membership for all the pta for the whole country start on august 1st so that means if you were pta member last year your membership already expired so you need to renew and go in and join and and the reason i mentioned about this because in february of 2021 and that's when the legislative session will be in session again. So that's when um, in January before pandemic. Um, so we PTA has the PTA rally day in February. And that's when 
parents, family, some students come, come to the capital and to represent the voice of the student, the family, and the teachers also, and to remind the state of Texas that they need to give priority to our student, our student education. And that affect the concern that AISD has as of something called recapture, because um, this year AISD pays six, $618 million back to the state of Texas, because we are in the city that the property is expensive, and with the form, very old formula, it's calculated out that, okay, you need to pay to share to other school districts. But again, on the other hand, the state of Texas take that money, but on the other hand, they, they're not matching that, they're not paying out as much as they can. Since they, they get more from several dis some district, like AISD is number one, that pay them and they reduce the part that the state itself that pay out to, to other school districts. So that's something that I would like to encourage everybody to speak up for all the students because it's not only for AISD students, but it's also for all the students in Texas because the state gave less priority to our students. That's why they keep reducing the money to, that they spend on our student. So go on, join um, PTA and uh, become members and, and um, uh, keep an eye out for February 2021. What's going on if pandemic is over? Are we gonna be, we are going to be at the Capitol and speak up for our student, our children. Um, so that, something that I would like to encourage everyone to do for now. Thank you. No, I do have a question for you. Um, yes. It seems like you're very plugged in to all of the information that the school's providing. How are you getting that information? Are you, are you going to meetings on the website? Can you tell us all the different ways you've been able to receive that? Yes, okay. So um, number one is, um, um, email is very important. The district sent out something called reopening emails. I send it weekly and I read that and it's, it's give a little verb of everything. And also they have daily in English and Spanish um, for, it's called ASD Live on Facebook that I watch a lot of that also. And also, um, I am I uh, subscribe to S, uh, ACPTA Communicate, which um, you if you don't know what it is, and if you happen to have parent support specialists at your school, they receive that, so they can you can ask them about the email, and then um, they can forward it to you, and then you can use the link on the bottom to subscribe to that. And yeah, so so one thing that I should have mentioned is communication is trendy from AISD, but on the other hand, it can be overwhelm, overwhelming. And, um, and so we need to kind of moderate it and try to maybe hold on to one thing like, okay, I just gonna check email, you know, because if I both check email and watch Facebook and all kind of stuff is many things, right? And it, it can, it can, turn you off from your interest and paying attention. And so I like to read the email and I watch some Facebook live also to add on to that. And of course I watch the AISD board um, meetings on Monday nights. And, <laughs> and um, so, and Robocall is very good because it's on point, um, precise, short. So that's one thing that I, my hope is ASD can um, keep up with this communication and make it better to um, meet the parent needs. Like to me, I still feel feel like um, I use um, certain app at, at the school and something called Remind. That's one app that 
um, the school, the teacher used to communicate with my children and I, I love it. And I've heard that uh, some certain um, population like Hispanic community, they like to use the app called WhatsApp because that they use to communicate free phone call and text with um, their family in other country in South America. So, so something like that, that I hope that maybe the district should look into expanding their way of communication, the medium of communication on that. And one last thing is I hope that policy that the district does and make decision on um, is come through equity lens for special education students, bilingual learners, African-American students, newly um, immigrant, and just immigrant that in this country, but like me, I've been in this country for a little bit over 20 years. I still need to navigate through the education system for my student. I didn't know this. I, this past year, um, my son was graduating and um, finding the school, finding the college for him. I didn't know a lot of school and um, with one counselor in the school for college counselor for the school of 600 senior students, that's very difficult to get into what he really needs. So that's something that I hope that moving forward, um, district make decision through equity lens and um, cultural competency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at the League, we always like to bring in policy experts, but it's also incredibly important to us to bring in perspectives from citizens like New who are living the experience that policy actually affects. So thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. Our next speaker has been a familiar face and voice throughout the pandemic. Dr. Mark Escott serves as the EMS System Medical Director for the City of Austin, Travis County, the Texas Department of Public Safety, and the Texas Division of Emergency Management. He also serves as Interim Medical Director and Health Authority for Austin Public Health. Um, Dr. Escott, you've had a busy year. <laughs> we know it's not over yet. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, what can you share with us from the public health perspective about reopening schools? Uh, first of all, let me uh, apologize because I'm sure you all are tired of hearing from me, but I've got some up-to-date information for you and uh, I'm going to share some slides because uh, I have some pictures and I want to show them to you. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit also about voting uh, because I was recently involved with the uh, uh, Travis County uh, Clerk's Office to, to help them prepare for uh, November 3rd elections. So I'm going to share my screen and I hope you all can see that. Yes, beautiful. All right, I've got 20 slides. I'm going to try to go through them quickly uh, so that uh, we can leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is our, our new cases. I want to start off by telling you and reminding folks where we are in, in terms of the pandemic. So what you're seeing here is our graph of, of new cases in Travis County. The blue lines are showing the new cases each day. The yellow line is showing the seven day moving average of those cases. Uh, and for uh, several weeks, I've been talking about this plateau in terms of new cases. You can see that, that line, uh, that 200 line, we really had a hard time getting through that. So we bounced up and down uh, a couple of times and finally have penetrated that and, and have a sharp decline over this past week. Uh, what we came to, to find out is that the state had a significant backlog of, of hundreds of thousands of cases that uh, hadn't been processed. And so what we experienced during uh, that two week period of plateau is a dump of, of old cases, cases that were older than 14 days old. So individuals who were no longer infectious. Uh, so what that did is it, it contributed to that plateau. When we researched this uh, and, and looked into fur further detail, we found out over the past two weeks that about 40 to 50% of the cases that we were reporting were greater than two weeks old. Uh, some from, a lot from July, and even some back as far as April. 
new cases that were being reported. Uh, so this put us in a much better situation in terms of uh, the risk uh, that, that we perceived in Travis County, the city of Austin. Uh, so I've been talking about for, for months now about our primary indicator, our key indicator of new hospital admissions. And that's what you're seeing here. Again, the blue is the daily admissions. The yellow is that seven day moving average. And uh, you know, for since the middle of July, we've seen this significant decline. We sort of flattened out a little bit at the beginning of August uh, and started this uh, slower decline. And then again, about the middle of August, uh, we you know decreased uh, quite a bit more rapidly. Uh, so we've got a much more significant de decline over the past week to ten days. Uh, we're very pleased to see that. Uh, right now, our our seven day moving average is under under 20, uh, which is great. Uh, remember our, our stage cutoff for uh, entry into stage two is less than 10 on that seven day moving average. Uh, when we look at the projections from the uh, University of Texas using their uh, epidemic modeling uh, system, the prediction is that as soon as September 13th, we may be below that, that line of 10 if we continue to have a decrease in, in cases as we're experiencing right now. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of, of our hospital situation. Uh, a month, two months ago, we talked about the concern about uh, exceeding capacity. Uh, we took action and the community took action and really blunted that curve, uh, really put the lid back on the, the spread of disease and it, it's come down quite nicely since then. Uh, right now, our, our uh, hospital bed situation is in good shape. Our ICUs are in good shape. Uh, we have plenty of ventilators. Uh, we're encouraging folks who may have been putting off uh, seeing their doctor or going to the hospital for an elective procedure to do those things now. Uh, if you or your children have been putting off physical examinations, back to school exams, or I apologize for that noise, uh, back to school exams or immunizations, Now's the time to get those done. Uh, so also over the past couple of weeks, I've been talking a little bit about uh, this transition to utilizing our positivity rate more than we have in the past. So why are we doing that now? We're doing that now because we have better data associated with, uh, with our, our labs. You know, we struggled for a long time uh, in getting that lab results in a timely fashion. We had the, the lag of the turnaround time and the uh, IT structure, which didn't allow electronic reporting. Most recently, we, we had the, the issue with the state, which seems to be resolved, uh, which you know, now we think we have better, more timely information regarding positivity rates. And you can see that since week 27, we've been on this progressive decline since then. Uh, the last week I'm reporting to you here uh, is week 32, which ended August the 8th. I haven't shown you the other weeks because there's still data coming in on those. But as the, that data stream improves, uh, our hope is to give you the information from last week on Monday or Tuesday so that you have more up-to-date information on where we are. I can tell you that looking at the data right now for week 33 and week 34, it continues to decline. Uh, so around 6 to 7% for week 32 and uh, 5 to 6% for week uh, sorry, week 33, uh, five to six percent for week 34. Uh, again, data still coming in that could change, but it does uh, give us again some uh, reassurance that that things are continuing to improve through everybody's hard work at masking and social distancing and, and the personal hygiene. Uh, but I, I want to point out that that you know as uh, we heard earlier, we can't be successful as a community unless we're all successful all races, all ethnicities. And what I'm showing you here is a breakdown of positivity by race and ethnicity. Uh, you can see that, that uh, red dotted line that I'm showing you, there's the 5% positivity rate, which we really want to get below before September 8th and the start of in-person schools. And what you can see is we have two groups uh, primarily that have been uh, consistently over that line. The gold line, which is our Hispanic or Latino, Latino group, and the blue line, which is our African American group. Uh, again, we've got more work to do in our communities of color to uh, suppress the, the spread of disease, 
to ensure that they have access to testing and masks and hand sanitizer and the other things they need, including education regarding the spread of disease so that we can help all of the groups get below that 5% mark, uh, hopefully before September 8th. And uh, also hopefully uh, that uh, I hope that we can keep it at that level for the remainder of the fall or until we get a vaccine, which is widely available. Uh, I want to show you this graph, which is our uh, breakdown, the same data set, but broken down by age group. Uh, you'll see that the green line on the far left is the uh, uh, one to nine age group, and the blue line is 10 to 19 age group. And you can see that that 10 to 19 age group uh, has been a, a prominent one for weeks now. Uh, week 34, which was last week, preliminary data right now shows uh, that uh, 10 to 19 age group, the highest percent positive uh, by a substantial margin compared to the other age groups. And I bring this up because it's important as parents that we know this, that we know that disease is spreading amongst our school age children. And we've got to continue to work hard uh, to ensure that, that they know that they're at risk, that we're protecting them, and we're encouraging them to avoid those social gatherings uh, where we know this is, is uh, often occurring. Uh, so that reassuring data that, that I spoke about earlier led us to uh, change our, our stage of risk to stage three. Uh, we, again, hospitals uh, decline in COVID admissions, the decrease in cases, the improvement in positivity, all positive signs. So we've changed this stage three. So what does that mean for us as a community? It means that you know, if you're a high risk person, if you have significant underlying health conditions, if you're over the age of 60 or 65, if there are members of the household that fits in one of those high risk categories, then you should follow that center column, which is the more protective one. So avoid social gatherings and gatherings <clears throat> greater than 10, avoid non-essential travel and stay home unless you have to go out. Uh, again, preferably if you have to go out to get groceries, curbside pickup, uh, or even better yet, have someone else uh, get your groceries for you if that's an option. It does loosen things a bit for those who are lower risk and whose households are at lower risk, uh, which allows uh, that non-essential travel, uh, you know, is uh, less restrictive on, on dining and shopping. Uh, but again, we are still working hard to get below that 5% level uh, so our recommendation right now is if, if you choose to go out to a restaurant, that's fine. But make it just your family unit, just your household. And, and avoid having large gatherings or going out to a restaurant right now with a larger group of people so that we can continue to work hard and get that positivity rate down. Uh, so a few things about our back to school guidance. Uh, for those who haven't seen this, this is available on our website, which is austintexas.gov forward slash COVID-19. Uh, if you follow the links, uh, a link will pull up there with our school guidance. It's a 52, 53 page document uh, that, uh, that our team put together. And uh, this is what we've sent out to our school districts and what we're basing our recommendations on uh, for this school year. Again, this is interim guidance and the interim is, was intentional because we expect that our knowledge of this disease is going to change. It's gonna change next week and next month and certainly change by October and November. So we have to be willing to change also. Our hope is that we will continue to uh, identify uh, options for treatments, that we will be able to uh, expect a vaccine, hopefully sometime in early spring that's gonna put us in a much better situation in terms of our community health, as well as the ability of our, of our children to go back to school uh, more so than may be possible this fall. So uh, this is the risk-based guidance, uh, and this is based on the, that first chart that I showed you, um, which is a, a few slides ago. So that same staging we're using uh, to make recommendations for, uh, for what our, our schools are going to do when they go back to uh, in-person learning. 
And I'll say that, uh, that this uh, document that we created was based on a lot of data, a lot of expert opinion, uh, and that included the National uh, Academies of, of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, who used the Austin-Travis County staging guide as an example of what communities uh, could do as they prepare for uh, going back to school. So the nuts and bolts of this is when we're in stage five, that's really our lockdown stage, 100% virtual learning. Stage four, up to 25% of students on campus. Stage three, up to 50%. Stage two, up to 75%. And stage one, up to 100% on campus learning. Uh, there's still distancing requirements for, for much of this, which is detailed in the plan. But one of the important things to remember uh, that we've advised our superintendents about specifically is that regardless of what stage we're in, we're almost certainly going to be in three, possibly in stage two if, if we do even better than we expect, uh, we're only going to, to open at 25%. So people ask why. And the answer is because we need the practice. Our schools need the practice. All of these processes are brand new for the teachers, the staff, and the students. And so they need an opportunity for at least a couple of weeks to learn the processes, refine the processes, get those 25% of students engaged in those processes before they start adding additional students in. We've seen over and over again across the country and across the world that when you, you, you try to shove students all back in the classroom at the same time, disease spread happens very quickly and many of those schools have had to shut down a week or two weeks later. So we're really focused on continuity of education and, and trying to create a safe system to ensure that students can continue to learn throughout the semester. And that not only we're protecting our students, but we're protecting those who are even higher risk. And that's the faculty and the staff of those schools. Uh, this graphic is showing you a bit on uh, what we consider close contacts. I present this slide because there's been a lot of questions around the community about this. Um, so basically, an individual who has been within six feet of somebody who's confirmed to have COVID-19 is a close contact. Right now, even if you're wearing a mask, that's going to be the case. So those individuals we're going to advise to quarantine at home uh, until, until they're cleared. My expectation is that as we continue to gather uh, evidence and we see data published regarding the risk uh, in the distance while people wearing masks, my guess is that we'll be able to close the gap from six feet to something shorter uh, in terms of, of who's going to be that, that higher risk exposure that needs to stay home. Um, there's some other uh, 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 examples of close contacts. Uh, if somebody coughed on you or sneezed on you or you kissed somebody who had COVID-19 or used utensils or, or drank something after them, uh, those are all definitions of close contact. Uh, and these are things that, that your children need to know about uh, because these are things that they need to avoid. And, uh, and again, the more we can educate our students in advance of, of September the 8th, the better chance we are of, of having success and the schools being able to open more students uh, two weeks after that. Uh, this is the, the uh, requirements for quarantine and isolation. I'm not gonna go through all the details here, uh, but basically uh, people who are a close contact have to be quarantined for 14 days. It doesn't matter if they get a test that says they're negative they're still stuck at home for 14 days. Why is that? Because the incubation period is 14 days. So if you get a test on day two and day four and day six and day 10, you could still turn positive later on. Will that change? Probably so. There's growing evidence that if you are not positive by day seven, day eight, you're probably not going to be positive. So my guess is that Throughout this semester, we'll be able to modify, modify that a bit more, uh, you know, test individuals with exposures at seven, eight, maybe 10 days, and then clear them 
so they can go back to school or back to work. Um, as you all may have seen in the news today, the FDA has, um, has issued uh, emergency use authorization for another Abbott Labs test, which is a rapid antigen test, uh, which returns results in 15 minutes and doesn't require a machine to analyze it. Uh, this may be a game changer. They're expecting to produce 50 million tests a day in, uh, by October. Uh, so this may be a test which is run in the school and we can utilize on a more frequent basis. It costs about $5 as compared to $70 to $100, of, you know, which is what we're paying for current tests right now. Uh, so more on that later, but this is, these are the rules now, uh, but we expect for them to change. Again, isolation is for somebody who has confirmed COVID-19. Uh, I'll stress the importance of separating individuals even within a home who are COVID-19 positive or who have symptoms of COVID-19 who are awaiting testing or awaiting results. That means masking in the home. That means social distancing in the home. That means cleaning surfaces in the home. Uh, if individuals live in a multi-generational household or are not able to separate themselves from other family members effectively, our advice is to use the, our isolation facility, which is a hotel room, it's free, Wi-Fi, cable TV, telephone, uh, it's all free. People can go there, isolate for themselves, and not risk exposure to other people. We have seen many times an individual comes home, will say dad for now, dad gets COVID-19, he isolates at home. And then four or five days later, mom gets it. And then four or five days later, one child gets it, and then another child gets it. Everybody in that household has to be quarantined 14 days past the last exposure unless they have had COVID and recovered. Uh, so what we end up with is some people get exposed multiple times and end up, end up at home for a long period of time. So again, if we can isolate, separate, uh, that cuts down on that. Uh, so a few points for uh, this school year. Uh, most important thing is have a plan for different circumstances that may happen throughout this year. You need to have a plan if your child develops symptoms, right? We want you to screen before that child goes to school. Do they have any symptoms of COVID-19? Do they have a fever? If the answer is yes, they've got to stay home. You need to have a plan for that. You need to have a plan if you get the phone call from Austin Public Health or from the school saying, hey, I'm sorry, your child has been identified as a close contact. They're gonna to need to stay home for 14 days. What are you going to do? Are you gonna be able to provide uh, somebody at home for that child? Are you going to need to, to call in a friend, a family member uh, to, to help you? Um, do you have internet access, a, a digital device at home for that child to learn from? You also have to, again, uh, plan for if that child gets sick. Uh, the schools are working hard to make it as safe as possible in the school setting, but they are never going to be able to protect your child 100%. The only way to do that is for the child to stay home and for nobody in that household to leave home. But generally that's unreasonable, so we have to accept some risk, and it's up to you as a, as a parent to determine how much risk you want to take. Uh, but the schools are working hard and doing the best they can to, uh, to really limit that spread. Again, we've got to teach our children, maintain the masking, maintain the social distancing. Uh, and we expect that to, to be the case throughout the fall semester. Uh, I mentioned screening before. And again, this bottom piece, I, I can't stress enough as well. You've, we've got to have those conversations with our children. And, I don't mean when I say hygiene, I don't mean the conversation I often have with my son about you need to shower and wear deodorant. I mean about how to prevent the spread of disease. Washing the hands for at least 20 seconds, using hand sanitizer if soap and water is not available often. Certainly uh, after going to the bathroom, before and after eating, uh, you know, before and after uh, touching commonly touched surfaces. Uh, coughing or sneezing into a bent elbow, uh, and by all means, We've got to teach our children, do not touch your face with unclean hands, right? We've got two major mechanisms of, of spread of, of COVID-19. 
One is that droplet. So if somebody talks uh, and exposes you or coughs or sneezes or sings at you, uh, and the droplet spread hits your mucous membranes, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. The other mechanism is what we call fomite. You touch something that has COVID-19 on it, and then you rub your eye, rub your nose, or eat something, uh, and then you expose yourself. That's, a, that's another uh, significant contributor to it, and we've got to make sure that our children are protected from that. People ask about airborne spread. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. We have demonstrated scientifically in an experimental setting that you can aerosolize COVID-19, uh, you know, an intact virus that's capable of spreading to others. All the studies so far in actual settings like hospitals where COVID-19, you know, people are coughing and sneezing and they're in a hospital room and they sample the air, there is not sufficient evidence to indicate that there is enough virus in the air in real life, intact virus, to cause significant spread. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible theoretically. Is it a significant contributor? Probably not. Uh, so school supplies, what do you need? At home, digital thermometer and a checklist every day, post it on the front door before you go outside. Does my child have this list of symptoms? Do they have a fever? If the answer is no, go out the door. If the answer is yes, stay home. Uh, pack a couple of cloth masks a day for your child. Make sure they're clean. Uh, make sure they're washed daily. Uh, I say two because I think for my son, it's probably going to be three or four because he'll lose uh, maybe three a day. That's just, just how he is. Uh, hand sanitizer, if, uh, if your child's age is appropriate, that they will uh, be able to use that and not harm themselves. Uh, maybe a, a small package of cleaning wipes if you can find them to encourage your child to, to wipe things down, uh, their desk, uh, other commonly touched services prior to, to using them. All right, a few slides about elections because this is the League of Women Voters and, and uh, I want to make sure folks uh, are aware of the safety precautions that Travis County is taking. So the first thing is this finger caught. And yes, I know what it looks like. Uh, but it is a protective device, um, and they're going to be available at the election sites. You roll it on your finger. It's like one finger of a glove, and you can press the screen. You can sign your name on the digital pad with your finger. You can use it to make your selections uh, on your ballot, and then you roll it off and throw it away. Uh, and they have hand sanitizer there for you to hand sanitize your hands after. Uh, so this is one of the things that's available to use. These high-tech things are also available, popsicle sticks. So you can select a popsicle stick and you just, you press it. Uh, personally, I'm afraid if I use a popsicle stick, I might press the wrong selection. So I'm gonna use the finger cut. Uh, but these will also be available uh, for you to use. They have uh, these devices that look very similar to this. It's basically a, a driver's license reader and stand. So you just drop your driver's license in there they read your information, confirm it, you pick it up, and you put it back in your purse or your wallet. Uh, so nobody else is going to touch your stuff other than you. Uh, masks are going to be required. Everybody who's there is going to have a mask on. Some poll workers are going to, uh, may wear face shields also. Uh, so I think they're going to make face shields available, partic particularly for folks who are, are more concerned or who may be at higher risk for complications if they're exposed just to give them an extra layer of protection. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's hard to say where we're going to be November 3rd in terms of risk. Uh, you know, there, there may be a run on, on supplies. Uh, so if they can't find these masks, this may be another possibility uh, if we run out. Um, so with that little comic relief, uh, I'll be happy to pass it back uh, to the team. All right. Yeah, Mary, I think we have a question in the chat if you'd like to ask. Yeah, uh, Dr. Escott, I believe that uh, this person is referring to one of the slides that you had in the first half of your presentation, uh, where you had several different colored lines. And she says, um, on the gold line for the population who is Hispanic, you mentioned lack of masks and testing. 
but she was also wondering, is access to physicians also a factor since, um, you know, we did not expand Medicaid and we have a lot of uninsured people in our state and uh, they don't have good access to uh, medical care or a way to pay for it? Uh, yes, uh, and so two things. Number one, when I was talking about masks and, and, and testing, uh, in our communities of color, we're really trying to focus efforts to ensure that, that folks are aware that they're available, that they're free, and that there are no strings attached. Their name doesn't go on some list you know, for later on to track you down. Um, it, 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 this is public health led, and our goal is, is to keep people safe. Without question, the, the lack of access to health care in this community, particularly in communities of color, particularly in our impoverished communities, it is a shame. Um, we are a wealthy country. We have plenty of resources. The reason people don't have health care is because we as a community have chosen that that's not a priority. And that really needs to change. There's only so much we can do regarding COVID-19. It's a respiratory virus. It's going to be challenging to control, particularly because so many of the cases are asymptomatic or have such mild symptoms that people don't even know they're sick. But what we could change is that access to care. Our rates of obesity, of diabetes, of heart disease, you name it, it's worse in our communities of color. These are not things which are difficult to diagnose, and these are not things which are expensive to treat. It is very cheap. But we as a state have decided that that's not a priority and that must change. We as a state have decided that we should guarantee people's access to emergency care, which is fine. You know, I'm an EMS physician, an emergency room physician. I've worked at community hospitals in Houston, Del Seton, other places in town. But I don't want to treat people as an emergency physician when it's the worst possible time to treat something. I want to treat them five years earlier, 10 years earlier, 15 or 20 years earlier when the diabetes first had onset, when the obesity first started. Because then it's easy, then it's cheap to treat. We've got to prioritize that health care and it, you know, our, our impact, no matter how hard we try with COVID-19 in our communities of color, there's nothing that we're going to be able to do right now to impact the hospitalization rate and the death rate that is, uh, is disproportionate in those communities. Because the underlying factors, healthcare, social determinants of health have been longstanding and, and it's gonna take a long time to fix as well. But that should be a priority this year for our legislative session. Thank you, Dr. Escott. Um, there are a couple more questions, but I think we're gonna move on now to Ms. Singh. And if you still have some time at the end, I can share those with you in the chat so you can be thinking about them. So thank you very much for that presentation. Also, is it possible for us to uh, put a copy of that on our website? It's perfect, okay, we'll get that from you afterwards. Uh, and now, last but not least, another familiar face for those of you that have been participating in the AISD roundtables and forums. Arthi Singh is AISD's trustee at large. She was elected to the board in December 2018 and is the first Indian American to serve on the AISD school board. She has been an educator, a PTA advocate, a STEM expert, and she also has uh, children in AISD. Ms. Singh, what can you share with us tonight about the reopening of schools? Hi everyone, it's so great to be here. Um, I love y'all, I love the League of Women Voters. Um, Dr. Mark Escott, it is such an honor to be on the same panel as you and new as well. Um, thank you so much for everything that, that you're doing with Austin Public Health. I know as a trustee, um, it just gives me so much peace of mind um, knowing that you guys are on top of things <laughs> and then we can rely on your guidance. So thank you for that. Um, so in Austin ISD, we, you know, we serve 80,000 students. Uh, we've got 130 or about 125 campuses, 12,000 employees. 
So I'll tell you, safety is a huge priority. It keeps me up at night. I'm sure it keeps a lot of you guys up at night as well. So I can tell you um, where we are as a district right now. Before I do, I want to ask you, Jessica, how much time do I have to speak? Uh, 10 minutes, then with some Q&A at the end. Okay, cool. All right. So um, we are start. We decided to delay the start of school to to September eighth. Um, that will give us that gave us a little bit more time to ensure that all of our students had technology, not only the hardware but also a hotspot and internet access. Um, even then, we know that if a child has the the computer and internet access, it doesn't mean that. The digital divide is closed um, because they still might need a parent to help them get online and to navigate blend which is our online learning system um, there might be a language barrier so there's like this whole other system of ensuring that students have access and so this really just just buy us some time to do that. Students will be te will be learning in an online um, environment for the first four weeks of school and um, if students do show up on campuses, we are expecting that a handful might show up. Maybe it'll be more than a handful, but certainly hopefully not more than 25%. Um, we will be equipped um, to, to serve them, although we are really imploring families to keep their kids at home. Um, <clears throat> after October 5th, the district may decide to extend the virtual learning for another four weeks. Um, we are, as Dr. Escott stated, um, you know, we, we need some time to practice, you know, make sure our systems are working, um, see what the COVID transmission rates are, the positivity rates and all of that. And before we make that decision to extend the online learning. Um, so I can just tell you that we are, there are a few things. One, we are really working towards ensuring that all students have the technology they need. Um, AISD is designing really high quality course content that can be delivered 100% remote off campus um, and on, on campus as needed for grade, grades pre-K through 12. And, um, and we're following the health guidance uh, from the local and, and state and federal officials. And our superintendent recently described our flexibility. She said, you know, think about um, in person versus once we do get the kids back in the school buildings, we may have to kind of dim the switch a little bit, a little brighter, a little lower, you know, in terms of being flexible with having kids in and out of school. We're trying to avoid the disruption because it's very hard on kids, it's hard on families and staff. Um, but we are really trying to come up with a way that will be least disruptive to student learning when we do go back to campuses. So we really are grateful for this time now to get our systems in place um, and, and anticipate and fix um, problems as they might come up. We will have, uh, I want to talk a moment about the health screenings um, to give you all a little peace of mind. Um, there will be health scre screenings taking place at um, prior to campus entry at every campus. Campus. Um, there will be social distancing measures. Um, we're going to definitely encourage and require frequent hand washing and disinfecting. Um, there will be face masks available for staff and students um, if they don't have them with them. Um, there will be student-friendly graphics all around the school um, reminding kids to keep their distance, to wash their hands. Um, we do have a COVID-19 response protocol that will be distributed to all of the campuses and we'll be doing contact tracing as well. Um, there will also be kind of like this little mobile app um, that will allow to uh, any visitors to the campus to go through their pre-screening questions um, prior to campus enter entry. Um, we're gonna have no touch thermometers, make sure everyone is fever free um, and all that kind of stuff. And a lot, I, I do get a lot of questions from staff and students um, and parents really about the actual facilities. Um, I really appreciate what Dr. Escott said about the, um, the aerosols, because I was concerned about that, um, quite frankly. We hear so much about the scrubbing down of surfaces, but I, I'm always like, well, I thought it was kind of spread through the air, but I'm glad to know that our hospitals really aren't seeing um, so much of that, if I understood you correctly. Um, but we are going to be having plexiglass sort of dividers um, at student desks. Desks will be spaced apart in the classrooms. 
there will be personal HEPA filters um, in our admin spaces and health rooms. We're going to have air movers and larger MERV 13 air filters sort of in the main hallways. Um, water bottle filling stations and we're actually going to have HVAC audits performed by um, the service center at each of our campuses um, and so there, there are going to be facility checks that happen at every campus before they actually open um, so so I think I think our district is really doing everything that it can do and I by the way we're not getting a whole lot of financial help to do this <laughs> um, the cost of all of this COVID stuff um, if you start from March um, of this year all the way through the end of this school year that we're about to begin, it's going to be about $60 million. Um, so that's quite a bit. And we um, were, yeah, so funding is a huge issue for us, um, as it is for many school districts. But there are a lot of things that um, that we are, we would love to see the community help advocate. Um, new, you talked about PTA and PTA Rally Day. Actually, no, New. Um, we met through PTA. I ran into her at Costco the other day, so that was fun <laughs> to catch up. But um, so we, um, the nice thing about PTA is we have about half a million members in. The state and so when when someone from PTA goes and advocates at the state they're like they're saying there are half a million members that are behind this and so join your local PTA and if you don't want to do that that's fine um, but advocate advocate for school finance reform advocate for um, the rainy day fund to be used for health um, to be used for our schools. We are having a really tough time. Um, advocate against charter schools if you possibly can. Charter schools are actually the biggest threat um, <laughs> to school funding after a recapture payment. A recapture payment this year, as New said, is about $618 million. That's almost half of our budget leaves the district, okay? So that's 600 about $600 million. Well, did you know that in addition to that, we lose $100 million a year to charter schools in Austin, which I feel personally is a redundant, um, inefficient, and frankly, mediocre system. Their outcomes are not real any better than what we have here in our district, and in many times they're worse. So, um, in fact, the State Board of Education is set to approve a charter school um, in September that's going to take $60 million more million out of AISD in ten, within 10 years. So that's a little side note, but it's all kind of related because it's related to funding. Um, if we have money, we can ensure that every child has the technology they need, that they get the mental health supports that they need through this very traumatic time. Um, it pays for our parent support specialists who are helping to figure out what to, how to help families who um, need childcare during this time or who, um, who don't know how to get online and they need training. Um, it pays for our, you know, like we're, we're still feeding kids. Um, every single day. We started that um, like two days after COVID sort of came to Austin and we've, we've already distributed about half a million meals to our families um, thanks to, um, you know, AISD, but a number of community partners. Uh, so th there's just a lot of uh, equity issues here. Um, the pandemic is revealing, you know, if there were equity issues before, the pandemic is just exacerbating them. Special education services are a big topic for parents as well, because many of those services have to be done face to face. Um, and, and we actually are going to be doing some face to face special education evaluation and services, even starting in September, because we just feel so strongly that we don't want any kids um, to fall through the cracks. So that's a quick little overview of what we're doing. I feel really good about the, the quality of education our students are going to get. It's going to be much much better than what you saw in the spring. Um, they have been really working and planning and supporting each other. I'm a mom, I've got two kiddos. Um, well, one's graduated in college, but I still have one in the district and I'm just super grateful to our staff because I think they're gonna really knock it out of the park. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have. 
Sure, we do have a couple of questions that I think uh, you may be able to answer, or Dr. Scott may be able to answer. Um, one of them is if parents do want to prep their kids to get ready to go in person, and we saw some of the slides and the checklist that Dr. Scott uh, had, is there other ways that parents can find resources to figure out how to prepare their students to know what to do when they arrive in person? when that happens? Yeah, uh, I'm sure there will be. I haven't seen any myself. I know that Johns Hopkins University has a, a like a training course that's like for a lot of our staff are going through those. I think parents ought to do that and they're going to get a lot of good information from that. Um, but as far as uh, things that are geared for kids, Dr. Eskai, you may know something that I don't know. Uh, so I, I think again, the, the, the key really is to, to make masks familiar to them, particularly little kids who, uh, you know, or younger kids who may not uh, have been out of the house and seen other people wearing masks. I think having a parent wearing a mask and, and teaching the child to wear a mask and, and getting used to that's going to be very, very helpful for the start of school. Uh, you know, obviously, smaller children have less ability to, to really understand what's going on and, and may be more challenged by seeing a bunch of people in masks. I know that because, you know, I see kids in the ER and, and uh, they get frightened easily with, with masks and gowns and, and so forth. Um, so I think having those conversations, starting to orient them uh, to those safety practices, washing their hands more frequently, uh, those are gonna be the, the biggest help. Great, and this next question may be for either one of you, so just jump in as well. Um, we had a question about who actually is the authority that decides whether or not to open or close schools. Uh, we've seen some stuff in the news, like kind of arguments about who that is. Is it the public health officials, the county judge, the ISDs, the principals? Can you all give us some feedback on how that works? Uh, that's a great question, and I'll tell you that there is substantial disagreement <laughs> about what the answer should be. Um, so chapter 81 of the Health and Safety Code is, is what gives me and other health authorities uh, our areas of responsibility. Uh, so in the circumstance of a uh, public health disaster, which is what we're in right now, um, there is a, a particular section uh, 81.084, which gives broader authority to the local health authority uh, to implement what we call control measures uh, to mitigate the, the risk of spread of the disease. Uh, when you look at, at the uh, legal guidance that the Attorney General sent to Stephenville, uh, in particular, he did not include that section of the Health and Safety Code. Uh, and I, I think that's because it is the exact piece of, of the statute that gives us the ability to do that. Um, again, our, this shouldn't be a fight. We're, we're, I think we're all trying to do the same thing. We're trying to get kids back in school, but do it in a safe way. None of us, particularly myself, who was at home yesterday supervising my kids' virtual education, None of us want kids to be learning at home if there's another safe option. What we're trying to do, what we're trying to advocate for is doing that in a safer way than TEA has planned. The superintendents who I meet with weekly want the same thing. What are the superintendents concerned about? Funding. They're concerned the TEA will cut off funding if they follow the plan that, that we've uh, laid out. A plan which was, you know, referenced to some extent by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. The, the, this shouldn't be a fight. I think the TEA needs to listen to the superintendents, listen to the local health officials, listen to the school boards, and give them the flexibility they need to determine what to do for their own school districts. It's a, it's a tough decision. It's about balancing the, the, the public health risks with the risk of, of uh, disruption of the continuity of education. And, and we've got to be able to find that balance. We, we can do that together. 
and that involves a bunch of stakeholders, uh, you know, troubleshooting this and, and coming up with the best plan that we can. I think we've done that, and my hope is that uh, that that the TA will be able to get behind that. I appreciate that, and I can just add from a trustee perspective, a TEA. Um, <sighs> They are, I think, I think they're really trying. <laughs> um, I have some friends who, who do work there and I think they, they are trying. They have a lot of political, oh, so much of this is politicized. Um, even here in Central Texas, Austin ISD is really um, the only district that is doing um, four weeks of virtual schooling. Like, you know, like real, you know, like we're not, we're begging people not to bring their kids to school. Um, EANS, they're allowing 25% of students to come in, in on September 8th. Leander is also doing 25% and they're requiring all of their teachers to be back on campus as well, from my understanding. And I think like Travis is just opening up as normal. Um, I think on September 8th, uh, which to me, it just sounds unbelievable. So you can just see kind of like, politically, how that kind of works out. Um, and so I just, what I'm trying to do as a trustee is model what we want our students to be, be when they grow up. That is use science and data to make decisions, you know, take care of each other. Um, it's really hard to do that when politics gets injected into that process. So we're doing everything that we can. And it's hard for a district because like I'm such an activist and I always have been my whole life. But as a trustee, I've got to sort of sometimes be careful because I don't want to draw negative attention <laughs> from Ken Paxton or, you know, others to our school district. So I rely on y'all. You know, if you see a problem with this and you want more local control, um, you know, help us out you know, contact your, your representatives and everyone else, because that is going to be critical. Um, I do appreciate that we can still rely on local health um, authority guidance. We can't use it prophylactically, you know, to prevent spread of the virus is my understanding. But, you know, if we're like at a state, if we jump up to a stage four again or whatever, we can use that to determine decision making. But it is really like a, a, a very, odd situation to be in because it is in some cases like not to be dramatic but i feel like sometimes we're having to make life or death decisions um and uh i hope that you know i feel like i feel like we're doing the best we can thank you thank you mary did you have any final questions you wanted to pitch to anybody there was one more question about um, asking if uh, Austin Public Health had done any kind of environmental evaluations of the schools since some of them are so old and, you know, have the AC systems and the airflow and stuff like that been evaluated? Uh, that's not something that Austin Public Health does, but it is something that we recommended in a, as part of the guidance is to evaluate the HVAC systems to ensure that they're, uh, they're optimized. Uh, our advice is that they maximize the turnover of, of the air. Uh, you know, it's, when I say aerosolization, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal if you're outside or if you're in a, a well-ventilated indoor place. Uh, if you're sitting in a closet with no air circulation, it's going to be a problem because uh, the air doesn't go anywhere. Um, and the longer the individual who's, you know, COVID positive is, is shedding, uh, virus, the, the higher the risk it's, uh, of spread. Uh, so it is a, you know, the HVAC systems are important. And uh, as, uh, as was said before, many school districts uh, are, are going through the process of ensuring those systems are functional or they're not functional, uh, making appropriate uh, repairs to those. Okay, well, that puts us right at about 8 30 at the end. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers tonight for taking the time to share your expertise and perspective. Um, you are very busy right now. You have a lot on your plates and we greatly appreciate um, you spending time with us tonight to share this information. We're going to be putting it on our YouTube channel uh, and trying to get everything you've shared with us out to as many people as possible um, so that 
more community members can have access to that information as well. Um, thank you to Leah Maziello who put this program together. Um, we're known a lot for voting and, and things surrounding voting, um, but we do do advocacy on the local level and we kind of see ourselves hopefully as advocates for the students in Travis County in the greater Austin area. We're going to be hosting another program similar to this on September 16th called Voter Empowerment, Overcoming Suppression Through Knowledge and Action, and kind of give you some updates on vote by mail and uh, different things the League is working on to make sure the vote uh, gets out largely and safely in the November election. Um, we hope that you'll join us then. Again, we're going to be posting a recording of the session uh, within the next week. Um, so thank you all uh, for spending your evening with us, and uh, we hope you have a good rest of your evening. We appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you.